Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We're on four and five this morning, and we're going to start out with Kimmy. She has asked me to read from page 75. It says, when we decide who it is to hear our story, we waste no time. We have a written inventory, and we are prepared for a long talk. We explain to our partner what we are about to do and why we have to do it. He should realize that we are engaged upon a life-and-death errand. Most people approached in this way will be glad to help. They will be honored by our confidence. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step, withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The the feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand-in-hand with the spirit of the universe. And I'm just, about Kimmy, I'm really glad she came to do this. I've always um, been very impressed with how honest she is on this step. So, way more than me. I don't know if if she's more brave or I'm more sick, but (laughs) I don't know. But she always does a great job, so. Hi, I'm Kimmy. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I have a sobriety date. It's September 8th, 1999. My home group is How It Works, and it's the best home group for me, and I am super, super current with the sponsor today. If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, welcome, welcome home. If you're new to the steps, welcome, welcome home. (laughs) Um, You're in the the right place. Um, I'm grateful to the committee. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to to speak on this step and to be part of this conference, and this is a lovely, lovely setting, and I'm grateful to be here. I had Kristen read that part. in the big book about being a life and death errand because when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous this last time in 1999, that's how it was described to me that this was a life and death errand. And my first sponsor had me so convinced that I was going to drink again if I didn't do this step and put a time limit on it that I did it, and I did it quickly. Um, how I got here is I had two DUIs, 25 days in the Miami-Dade County Jail, I'm way too cute to be in jail, that didn't work out, and a bunch of ruined relationships. So, and when I first got to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I came in through Miami, Florida via my third treatment center. I didn't want anyone in that room to know that I had been to jail. People would get up and tell their story and talk about being in jail and talking about doing this and doing that, and I'm like, how are they telling us this? This is crazy. And so um, that changed because then I thought since I went to jail, I had a story and I could actually be in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, but my experience with the four step is I've done four of them. It's not recommended. That's just how my experience goes and how my story goes. And I don't speak for Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just here to share what happened, you know, what works for me. It was great, though, because those two first four steps um, got me a little bit of clarity and a little bit of hope. And if I would have had to put my hand on a bite I would have told you I had given you all my secrets that I could at that time. Um, my, my first sponsor relapsed at six years of sobriety and I had six months and I got a new sponsor and the first thing out of my mouth to her was she's like okay you ready to start the steps over and I'm like why do I have to do four and five again I've already done that she relapsed I didn't I don't understand why I have to do this step and she was like well if there wasn't more to be revealed you wouldn't be worrying about this step and she was right so I sat down with her and I um, did a four and five with her and I got a little bit more hope and a little bit of more clarity and then um, the pivotal fourth step for me was my third one. I had about a year and a half sobriety, and I was living in Miami, Florida, and I was working the corporate by day, you know, job by night and at the bar, or the corporate by day and the, the bar at night. So they call me, you know, corporate by day, hoochie by night, and I was okay with that. And, um, but I was dying inside because I had worked the steps twice, and I thought that that was all I needed to do. You know, I wasn't, I still had the same behaviors. I was a dry drunk, basically, and I had a year and a half sobriety, I wanted to put a gun to my head. I didn't want to drink again. I didn't want to do drugs again. I just wanted to die. And it's an awful, awful place to be in sobriety. So um, God stepped in and did for me what I couldn't do for myself and moved me to Salt Lake City, Utah, from Miami, Florida. 
and you were all Mormon, and it was a dry county, and I wouldn't have to do Alcoholics Anonymous. I was like, woohoo, I'll be on a mission. It's a two-year commitment with a Marriott client, and I was really excited about that. And I went to the holiday group, and 150 people, when I shared that story, laughed at me, and I felt a little bit at home. Um, and then I started hanging out with this home group, and they were all men, and they were all carrying this book around, and it was all underlined the same, and they were smiling, and they were happy, and they were talking about doing this fourth and fifth step and going on this ride to Windover and all this crazy stuff, and they were happy, and I wanted what they had. And so my best thinking was um, I'll date one of them. You know, if I just date him and stand next to him, he has three years of sobriety. I have a year and a half of sobriety. It'll rub off on me and I'll look good. I could be the AA trophy wife. That was what I wanted to be at that time. And then um, we both made it through that crazy relationship without drinking. Thank you, God. And then I met, um, there was this, this, this man in the program taking these guys through this book. And um, I wanted what they have. And he said something to me, which to me was a challenge. So I asked him if he would walk me through this book. And he said, yes. And what he did for me is he opened up the front page of the book, and he said, Kimmy, this is what you know about Alcoholics Anonymous, but you're willing. And the page is blank. I was like, what? I know more than that. So um, he asked me the questions if I would call him every day, and I said, yes. He asked me if I'd show up to his house once a week, and I said, yes. And he said, we go to home group meetings. I said, yes. And then the kicker for me, because I don't do alcohol and drugs, right, and I don't do relationships, right, he said, Kimmy, are you willing to work the steps without dating? And I said, yes. And that saved my life because then I got to look at me and not blame it on outside circumstances. So I remember um, going over to his house, and we did the third step, and we got on our knees and um, did all that. And he said, you know, it says in the book, next, not four days from now, not four months from now, not a year from now, next, you know, we launched out on a vigorous action. And I was really excited for that because he gave me a time limit. He said, let's get this fourth step done. I'm going to give you four weeks. Let's make a date right now. And I left his house with those first two columns, the resentments and the causes. And I'd never done a four step this way. Normally I went straight across. And he had sent me home with the first two columns. And I'm like, this is easy. I can write down who I'm resentful at and why. Because that's super, super easy for me. Because I'm going to tell you what you've done to me. And then we got to the effects. And for me, at my core, I am an insecure self-centered little girl scared of life. That's all I am at my core. That's what this four step showed me. And then the next column, you know, my part. Oh, my gosh, I have a part in this? Are you kidding me? If they wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have reacted that way. So I got to take a look at my part, and then that last column, you know, what I could have done differently was typically everything the opposite of what I did. It's like that Seinfeld episode where George does everything opposite and he has a great day. That could be me if I did anything opposite. So then I I call him up. You know, he gives me the fear list and the conduct inventory, you know, like I like to call it instead of the sexual inventory. And so I call him up and I said, hey, I'm ready to take that ride. And I was really excited because we go to Wendover if you're 21 and you don't have a gambling problem. So I was really excited to go to Wendover. And he said, okay, Kimmy, now I want you to take out five. Um, three by five cards and I want you to write down your five take it to the grave secrets and all of a sudden in my head I go he knows I'm hiding something and for me what I was hiding um, I had, didn't realize how much I was hiding but I had started going to meetings when four and five was going on and it's really cool for me how meetings seem to I hear something that I need to hear with the steps that I'm on and I remember hearing you're sick as your secrets you're sick as your secrets you're sick as your secrets at pretty much every single meeting I went to. Whether they said it or not, (laughs) that's what I was hearing. So I was like, he knows I'm hiding something. And for me, I grew up in the Catholic church, in Catholic schools, with the Catholic God who could see under the, you know, in the dark and under the covers. And I had done a lot of really bad things that I didn't want this other person to know about because I didn't want them to look at me differently. And I just remember um, thinking, how am I going to tell this person this stuff you know, he's not going to like me anymore. I'm going to get kicked out of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's going to kick me out of the car on the way to Windover. It's going to be on the billboard. And um, I just remember sitting down because I had said enough Hail Marys and enough Our Fathers for those to be cleared, I thought. But in step five, it talks about, you know, me, God, and another person. I'd missed that part in the first two steps with these few little secrets that I was keeping. You know, I'm the girl that didn't want to sit there and tell you what happened to me at 17 years old. I didn't want to tell you. 
about having to terminate a pregnancy. I didn't want to have to tell you about stealing money from my friends and my family because no one steals money. <laughs> and so I was just, like, really nervous to put these on these cards. And so I got them down, and I remember practicing in the mirror, like how I was going to say these and how I was going to sneak them in. And I was looking over my inventory, and I, got, I have all these pages, and then I can sneak in and take it to the grave, and maybe he won't hear it. And so I call him up and I say, I'm done. And um, we get in the car to go on this ride. And it was really great for me because he wasn't staring at me when we were going through this ride. And I just remember um, <laughs> getting in the car and he said, we said this prayer and we're, we're driving. And he goes, okay, Kimmy, take out those five, take it to the grave secrets. And I'm like, what? And I giggled for about 20 minutes. Those of you who know me, I giggle when I get really nervous. And so I get giggled for about 20 minutes and I got to get those secrets out. And I got to feel a little bit better. And um, my God is very, has a sense of humor. Because after I told those secrets and we got to Windover, and this is a cute little story that I love, um, we uh, that's when they had the slot machine still. And you could pull the lever, and it was fun. And he gave me a roll, a $10 roll of quarters. And he sat down, and he was playing slots. He's like, oh, this machine's cold. And he moved over, and I sat down, and I won money. So God rewarded me for telling my secrets. <laughs> and that's what I needed that day. And so we're coming back, and um, I remember it was a Thursday night, and it was that holiday meeting, and something was different. I went in, and I sat down, and I got quiet for about an hour, and I went over the first five proposals that it, I've been taught, and it talks about. And um, I knew I had a lot to work on, and had done a lot of stuff, but um, I felt a little better. You know, um, my sponsor today talked about my shoulders felt a little bit higher, like there was this weight lifted off. And... Um, I love that part in the book because I went to that meeting that night and I could look you guys in the eyes. You know, it was like I had cleared my soul and um, it was great. It was really, really great for me. And then I remember more importantly, I was getting ready that night and I could look myself in the eye. You know, it made me forgive myself a little bit more and love myself a little bit more just by getting those take it to the grave secrets out. So that was huge, huge for me. And I totally, totally... I would swear today that that saved my life. That four step saved my life. That man changed my life. I owe him, and um, I'm super, super grateful for me. And then I got to go on and work the, the rest of the steps. And that guy, um, a really neat thing is he pointed out to me something my first two sponsors didn't, and probably because I didn't give them enough information. I have this wonderful family that the second I quit drinking, they were there. You know, I had three months of sobriety, and I got the keys to the car, my three-year-old nephew, you know, money to the, money to go to the beach. When I went home for Christmas, I just have a very forgiving family. So I didn't think I owed them anything. I'd never made an amends to them. I'd never done anything except for, oh, I'm sober. Here I am. Aren't you happy? Look at me. Pat me on the back. And so um, uh, he pointed that out. So I was going to my family reunion, and he told me not to get off the plane unless I made a proper amends to my family. And I know this is about four and five, but if I wouldn't have, he wouldn't have pointed that out for me in four and five, I would have never have made those amends properly to my family. And that started a wonderful relationship with my mother that I never had in 11 years, calling her every morning, being able to hang out with her, because all she wanted was more of my time. And a few years ago, she gave me the best, best compliment ever. She said, you know, honey, it's really nice to have conversations with you. Because I used to write her great letters. I can write. I can write you a letter and leave it for you and run. But I never had that one-on-one -on -one relationship with my mom like I had with my dad. You know, I got five skin, you know, red skin earrings when I was five years old. I'm a daddy's girl. I followed him around like a puppy dog. But I was always scared of disappointing my mom. So um, when she said that to me, that was a direct result of doing the footwork of four and five. And I lost her on April 29th this year to cancer very suddenly. And it was so great because my side of the street was clean. And I got to show up and be there and hold her hand. And there was no regrets. And it was all love. And I'm so, so grateful for four and five. Because if I wouldn't have done those, I wouldn't have that relationship. And um, if I can say anything about... Four and five, I did one after that, and every once in a while I have to do a mini one when certain things come up, aspects in my life that when it's blocking me, something's blocking me from God. 
And I had to do one not too long ago with my current sponsor that I've had for over 10 years, and um, I didn't have to make an amends out of it. You know how cool it is to do a four and five and not have to make an amends? Because I reacted differently. You know, all that stuff was in my head, and I was nice about it. Um, it was with my stepdaughter and her mother, and I showed up, and I was nice to her mom, and I was nice to her, and I did everything I could, but I had all this stuff inside. So uh, my sponsor had me write down that stuff and do a mini four and five on it, and it was really cool for me, a goof like me, to not have to make amends for a four and five. So there's gifts and promises on every side. And um, if I can say anything about four and five, it for me it is a life and death errand. Put put a date on it, get it done. It's not that scary. I just told you mine. It's not that big a deal. I'm sure everyone's heard it. And I'm just really really grateful to be here and really grateful to share um, four and five with you guys. So thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Kimmy. I decided it's both. She's braver and I'm thicker, so <laughs> just kidding. All right. Um, Mike is going to be um, the next panel speaker. He is, has been awesome enough. I called him a couple months ago. He lives in Idaho, and um, he's been kind of a staple at this conference, and um, I'm really excited that he was willing to come and um, be on this panel. So he asked me to, to uh, read a little bit from page 63 to kind of um, – Reintroduce again the step three and before step four and five. So it says, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in, our, in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter we were reborn. And here's Mike. Okay. Oh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. My name is Mike Caldwell, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Mike. Hi. My sobriety dates uh, June 15, 1993. My home group's a spearhead group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Pocatello, Idaho. Well, it ain't my home group. I just hang out there. Look that way. <laughs> Uh, that's another story. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, ever up there? Come on up. Uh, we got a little different kind of a format. We, uh, I don't, we, uh, we, we qualify people when they come in. We give them an opportunity to find out if Alcoholics Anonymous is something that they want to do. Because uh, of this, uh, Kimmy touched on a little bit in her in her sharing there that uh, you get here, and and uh, for me, I wanted to fit in so bad. Um, that's how I got out of the second grade. You know, I fit in, you know, and and uh, I answered everything that they wanted me to have answered, and then I then I uh, then I got to go to the third grade, and I still don't know why I wanted it. Well, I do know. I finally done an inventory on why I wanted to get out of the second grade so bad, and uh, that's part of this uh, process that this uh, the steps have done for me, and and that's kind of what I want to talk about. Uh, I'm going to make a comment too. This is an opinion. Folks who get up at 8 o'clock in the morning to be at a, st a step study conference or a step study panel uh, on 4 and 5 might have a little wondering about how they're doing it. <laughs> and uh, that's okay. I have the same way. You know, I'm, I, I went through to Sun Valley one time to do a, listen to a guy uh, tell us how to do a fourth and a fifth step. And, uh, and it was an old, uh, all weekend thing. And, and I got something out of it and it was wonderful. The, 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 the thing was that, uh, uh, I'll tell you about it here in a minute. But uh, so, uh, if you're new, relatively new, wondering about this thing, uh, that, that's why I had to read that paragraph <clears throat> on sixty sixty three, uh, because some work is, has happened, hopefully, in your in your program or in your life for you to be wanting ready to go ahead and do this. So, uh, anyway, uh, my story was I showed up at Alcoholics Anonymous. I stayed sober and dry for about four and a half years. And uh, I was like, Kimmy, I, I, I don't know if I was suicidal, but I was sure homicidal. I wanted to kill some folks because uh, you guys were liars. <laughs> you guys <are> liars. <laughs> Nobody can be that damned happy over a long period of time. And then the problem was with me is I'd hung around and watched, and some of them were liars. And, uh, and, and I couldn't figure out how they were staying sober. I was trying to match my insides up with you guys' outsides, and it wasn't happening. And, 
So I got to go get drunk again, and uh, I had a wonderful experience. It was just the shits. And uh, I, ca I couldn't slow this thing down. It just kept going and going and going. So anyway, uh, long story short, I decided to come back and do this thing. And, I, and I, where, I, where I was at in Idaho at that time, there wasn't too many folks that knew much about the book. I'd been to places and I tried to hook up and uh, with folks, and I just hadn't, I just, I don't know, just me being my ego, and, and I know more than you do, and I'm going to pick this up my way. I was at arm's length with everybody for a long time, and uh, because of that, I was there, I was, I was desperate need to do something, but people had talked about this this book a little bit, I'd listened to it, and so I knew I had to get on my knees and do the third step prayer, and there's an out there, it says you can do it by yourself, you know, if you don't want to, so I, well, I got on my knees with my coffee, <laughs> Next to my coffee table, and I done my third step prayer, and made an appointment with a clergyman to go uh, to do my fourth step. And the book tells me I can do that. It says I can, there's five different ways you can do a fifth step. You got all kinds of professional people, family members, closed mouth friends. You've got uh, psychologists and doctors. So anyway, I, well, I would talk to this this guy. I didn't really like him, uh, but I knew he was a secret keeper. <laughs> Oh, very important. <laughs> Closed mouth friend. So anyway, I uh, I decided I'd go see this guy, and so I wrote down a. Uh, I was real thorough about. It. I mean, I was as honest as I could be about. It. I mean, there was nothing I didn't leave out. And what I found out today, and from doing another uh, uh, format of this, is I was doing an immoral inventory. I was going back and I was confessing my crime, sins, and and shortcomings. And I went and I seen this guy, and I was with him for about two and a half hours, and all I did was proceed to piss him off. Uh, he, he didn't, he knew I was not there to repent. Uh, I was there to get rid of this stuff. And I told him that when I started. And he thought I should be a little more, well, I don't know what he thought. I'm reading his mind. But I knew he was mad. I knew that. And, uh, so consequently, I, I sure didn't feel like I was walking on the broad highway when I left there, you know. I was, uh, <laughs> but I'd done it, and uh, and I went home, and then I, well, this is, I, once again, I had no expectation this thing was going to work, so uh, I didn't, I wasn't disappointed, and uh, so I kept going along there, and I was reading in the book about six weeks later, and it says, well, within an hour of finishing this, you're supposed to do this step, you know, this. Oh, I've got to do the seven step. Well, I haven't done that. So, bang, I'm on my knees. I do the seven step. Get up from that and nothing. So, uh, you know, okay, this is cool. And, uh, but I knew I was supposed to kind of set some things right. I knew I wasn't supposed to apologize. I'd heard that. If you're saying you're sorry in an amends, probably in an amends. If I'm saying I'm sorry, I'm demanding that you forgive me. I'm flat demanding it. Because what do you do when you fight your little brother? Mom breaks you up, and you tell you sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Then it's over with. I'm demanding that somebody change their behavior if I'm saying I'm sorry in, a, in an apology. So anyway, I'm, there was a couple of three people that I wanted to take out on the desert and put a bullet in their head, and I left them off this list for a while. They was on it. But there were some other folks that I could see once in a while, and I run onto a couple of them, and I said, hey, you know, I'd like to let you know that I'm trying to change, and you won't have to worry about me coming up near shooting you. You know, basically, <laughs> and uh, they kind of looked at me like, "Yeah, we've we've watched you over time, and you can you have the possibility to do that." So they just okay, you know, didn't say anything else. And, and uh, so about uh, two or three weeks, months later into that, I don't really know how long it was, but anyway, I woke up one morning and I was surrounded with love, and I had a spiritual awakening as a result of those steps. And the compulsion obsessed to use alcohol was lifted, and I have walked on the broad highway. I've had every one of those promises, spiritual promises, in my life. I've also had all of the 10-step promises, all of the 11-step promises. So let's talk about what happened later on. I'm doing this stuff, and I'm trying to help people. You know, I'm trying to pass on, hey, this stuff's good. You know, and so I'm talking and working with folks, and some people over a period of time get it, and some people don't. And as luck would have it, a guy moved from, luck would have it, God did have it, a guy from uh, California moved up in our area here about, oh, six years ago, and he's a thumper, and anyway, uh, he started a little book study, and we started going through the book, and it took us three years, three and a half, little over three and a half years, to go from the title page to the end of Dr. Bob's Nightmare.
And I learned a little bit about the big book Alcoholics Anonymous from these guys. And I'm kind of a studier. That's right. I got out of the second grade. It was the best four years of my life, but I got out. <laughs> and uh, you have to ask this is tough. Just don't go there. Okay. So anyway, uh, the, I decided to uh, one, maybe once again try this four-step stuff. And this guy gives me a format. And it makes a lot of logical sense to me today how it, how it happens. But what the core for, for me in the, in the fourth and the fifth step is, is the idea that I'm going to figure out, with God's help and a, and, his, and, a, and a human witness, my shortcoming. What is my shortcoming? And what's the cause of those shortcomings? And two-thirds of the time, I'm doing this. Oh, okay. One-third of the time, God, ain't I cool? And the reason I'm cool is because I've got this thing figured out and I can manipulate what I absolutely have to have happen. So, you know, yeah, it worked out the way I figured. Then it don't work out. Oh! Here lately I figured it out, too. i got this going on. Uh-oh, oh, gee, this is bad, but I'm getting my way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but what drives all that? And that's what that fear inventory has done for me. I've, 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 I got, I'm, I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear. Fear. A hundred forms. Not one, two, three. A hundred forms of fear. Self-delusion. That's this stuff, you know. Self-seeking. Oh. Huh? Well, doesn't everybody know that we'll all be better off if we do this, you know? Self-seeking. Yeah. And self-pity. Oh, boy. If you had my folks, if you had the way I was really, you'd do that, that, that. <laughs> So, and a hundred forms of it. So, I, I, I don't know. I, I've got all these things going on. So anyway, I'm doing this stuff, and, and then I get into a fear inventory, and I've got the same sponsor I've had for shit, 16 years, and we're teaching one another this stuff back and forth. He's growing. We don't just go to one deal and say, this is what we're going to do. We, we, we try things out. We do. We had to. We had to do that so that we could stay sober and relatively sane and alcoholics and anonymous. And so I've got one, I got a book. I got my little book, you know, the, the $4 book. And, and, and anyway, I, uh, excuse me. Anyway, every year I go through it and I, I put a new one in, and I mark it up, and then I and I give them away or whatever. But I'll go back and the book five years ago has got a whole bunch of different stuff marked up than this one does, because something's changed. Something's changed. And so what I found in my inventory lately is these fears boil down to two fears, you know, you know, two fears, and and they're both started when I was in the crib. Literally in my in a crib. First is fear of being abandoned, and and the other one is uh, I'm unlovable. And there's only one power on this earth that can remove that fear from me, and that's that's not on this earth, but that I've found that I've tapped in this in this process, and that's that and that's that that's that God stuff, you know. You know, I hate to bring that up. You know, we like to talk about higher power here, but it's God. It's God. He's got something going on here, or we wouldn't all be here. And so, as a result of that relationship that I've established not only with him and being open with another human being, I've made a witness on this plane and on the another plane about those folks that I've heard. And so this amends process is not an event. It's an ongoing thing. So as this process goes on, <laughs> talk about living amends, I think that, I, I think this go opinion this thing goes on after I cash in, you know. I get to go talk to those folks. I get to have a relationship with those folks. And my job today is to remove the fear in their life that I instilled in them. And how can I do that unless I know the fear that I'm carrying? So, a little bit in that, isn't there? I don't know. <laughs> I'm dumber than the box of rocks. I really am. I really am. The, the smart rocks are the ones on the side of the hill. I'm in the water. And that water's rushing over me. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right, we're going to have um, Kevin is going to be our Al-Anon panelist. He asked me to read from page 66, the second paragraph that says, It is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. 
To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal, for when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. Good morning. I'm Kevin. I'm a grateful member of the al family groups. Yes. <clears throat> and I and I want to apologize for my attire this morning because I wasn't planning on being on the panel. I was hoping to be a part of the audience. <clears throat> but, you know, you do what you're asked to do. That's what my sponsor always told me. He told me I could never say no. If I was asked to do something in this program, I was to stand up and be ready to do whatever was asked. And, you know, that wisdom is held true. Um, my recovery has blossomed every time that I've been willing to say yes. Every time that somebody's asked me to, to help them understand a step, to be of service to others, man, I grow ten times more. And I get the opportunity to talk about this morning. It's funny because I was talking with Kimmy before. Kimmy and I have been on the same panel for the last three years. <laughs> It's amazing. You know, she's, she's seen me walk in this morning and she says, what, we're not on the same panel? And I went, no, I don't have a panel job this year. <laughs> Lo and behold, God has a plan. Um, and so I get to share again the wisdom of what these two beautiful people brought before us in four and five. See, I can't do a four until I've done a three i got to know who my higher power is because I've got to be able to tap that. I've got to know what's going on in my life, honestly. You know, in Al-Anon, we use a book called The Blueprint to Progress. It's a blue book. I tell every one of the people that I work with, because they rush right out, they got to have that four-step book. I forgot to bring one up with me, but they think that that's the answer. It is, but it's not the right time. I have to be in the right time to do the work that I have to do. And they're written in an order. I have to have identified and started to have a relationship with God. Otherwise, I cannot do a thorough four-step. And in this blueprint to progress, the very first section in it is honesty. I wonder why that's there. I used to think about this often. I'm honest with you. I'm honest with everyone that I know, but I'm not honest with me. My situations are what I'm not honest about. I will manipulate and control and try and do what is what I believe is right for you because I don't know how not to be honest with me. You know, I've got to go through these steps many times. And one of the things that I keep discovering is that each time I go through it, I thought that I'd given my list of everything that I was going to carry to the grave long ago. The first time I did my my fifth step, my sponsor said, so now tell me the one thing you'd never tell anybody. And I looked at him and I went, I don't know what that'd be. So I made up something. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, me too. And I went, what? You too? I just made that up. You know, I'm thinking this. I just made that up because I didn't know what he was really asking me. And he says, me too. And I went, wow. Wow, That's. I guess that's pretty cool. <clears throat> I knew what you were doing. <laughs> you know, but I got a chance to do that right. Um I got a chance to get honest with another human being. Um, but I but I had to learn how to get honest with God. I had to learn how to get honest with me. You know, it was a freeing thing for me to understand that, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking to myself, because my very best thinking gets me in these rooms, I'm thinking to myself, well, why do I need to tell God the nature of my wrongs? He already knows. He's been with me everywhere I've gone. I've discovered this, you know. He wasn't lost. I just left him at the campsite. <laughs> i got to go scout ahead. That's part of my M.O. It wasn't that I didn't believe in God. I had no faith in God. 
And it's one of the things that I keep, that I get an opportunity to work in every day is that I have to start with my faith. It's not that I don't believe. I have no faith. So I'm too willing to allow God to sit at the campsite and I say, God, wait here, I gotta go scout ahead. Cause I got a plan. I had, I got a plan and I gotta go see what it looks like. And I come back and I'm wounded and I'm beat up and I got arrows sticking up my, out of my butt and everything else and I say, where the hell were you, God? And he says, all you had to do is ask. See, I mean, that's how silly I think. I think that I have a plan. God keeps demonstrating to me that I don't. And every time that I allow God to work his plan, my life gets better. My life gets easier. And I wouldn't have that relationship if I had not been willing to work a thorough fourth and fifth step. It's it's that type of recovery that I get to see over and over again. See, I'm one of these guys that came into Al-Anon because my wife was in her fifth treatment center at the time. And I know what I heard from the counselor that day. He promised me that if I'd go to Al-Anon that they would tell me how to keep her from drinking when she got out. Now, I know that's what I heard him say. Okay? Because I have selective hearing as well. And yet, the message that he kept saying to me, because I keep going back to him, I say, Chuck, man, they're just not talking about this stuff. And he's going, you were just at the wrong meeting. Go to another meeting. (laughs) Keep going back. See, that was the message. I had to keep going back until I could open my ears to hear what I needed to hear. And when I do that, then I hear the stuff that I don't want to hear, that I'm a part of the problem. I'm a big part of the problem. I wanted it all to be your problem. But now I've got to look at me. So being the good al that I was, I went home on a Saturday afternoon. I was separated from my wife at the time. Saturday afternoon living in this little apartment. And I went, okay, i got to work the steps. So Monday morning I promptly announced to the Monday morning uh, meeting that I had worked my steps over the weekend and I was ready to sponsor anyone. My future sponsor came up to me after the meeting and he said, Kevin, you may want to work those steps with the sponsor the next time. And I, and I promptly realized that that was exactly what I needed to do, and I asked that man to take me through. What I gave was an insight of me that I had no clue of who I could be. Because I, I suffer from fears of abandonment. I suffer from fears of self-resentment. I suffer from fears of dishonesty. I suffer from resentments. And I could never have known that had I not been willing to do the work. With that knowledge, then I have the ability to sit with it, and then I get to go take the action of the fifth step and ask somebody else to listen to what I have to say. That freeingness of doing a fifth, of doing a prepared fifth step is amazing. I don't, I've never had to carry any of that with me ever again. If you're new to this program, there's one way through this. It's called pain. You know, my sponsor used to say to me, the only way out of pain is through it. And I used to think, what a crazy thought that is. But it's right. He's right. He has been. You know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to understand what I need to go through, I need to walk through it. Because that's where the recovery is at, is walking through it, not staying in it. Thanks for letting me share this morning. Thank you guys. we're just going to open it up. I um, really appreciate these guys sharing honestly about their experience. And, um, you know, I, for, when I did my four-step, my sponsor asked me to commit to doing writing 30 minutes a day. 
and uh, called me. Well, I called my sponsor one day, and, and um, you know, he asked if I'd written on my four step that day, and I said, "No, I don't really like the way it makes me feel when I write that stuff." <laughs> and um, I really meant that. And um, you know, my sponsor said back to me, "You know, this is not about feelings." This is about the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous that make those feelings bearable. And um, for me, that um, got me through the rest of writing down that four step <laughs> and um, still saves me today, you know. Um, I have a sponsor who cares more about what I do than how I feel. Um, as far as that fifth step, um, when I got done, I had those those promises, you know, for about 30 minutes. And then, my, and then I felt worse. And I called my sponsor, and my sponsor said, good, you should feel the way you do. Look at all the stuff you've done. And, um, and then my sponsor said, that's why there's more steps. So, um, yeah, so that's the next step, six and seven. So it's opened up to you guys. I know a lot of you have to have experience in this, so talk. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. My name's David B. Hi, David. Hey, David. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, and I was just sitting there thinking about um, I'm grateful I wasn't on a panel this year because there was some question about whether I was going to be or not. And, um, you know, my ego is very selective. Sometimes if I'm comfortable, I, I love to hear myself talk. And um, other times I'm just so afraid because I feel like I don't have anything to offer. Um but what are we talking about? Um, four and five or six and seven? What's the? Four and five. five. Okay. Um, you know, my uh, my experience in this program is about is about um, coming back. Uh, it's about um, when I got here. I'd never. I have ne- had never really. Um, never been able to to have any kind of continuity in my life with anything that I had done and um, I was a guy who <clears throat> was given all the right things and all the right breaks um, by my parents and, and, and people and if I didn't get them I manipulated into them and so things came very easily for me um, and pain was something that I didn't face because I didn't have to at least that's what I thought um, I didn't have to walk through stuff or push through stuff because, uh, you know, I was the only boy of four sisters and, you know, damn it, uh, I was special, at least according to my mom and my family. And so, um, when I got, I kept, you know, ending up in treatment centers and I kept ending up, um, getting sent back and forth from parent to parent to parent to parent. And I started to ask myself over time, wondering why that was happening, um, it was just so unfair, you know, and I just started to feel like, well, um, I, I didn't really feel wanted or have a place in the world. So I really identify with those <clears throat> fears of abandonment. Um, but I don't think I ever gave a second thought to any of this stuff that we talk about here in AA until I, I was here for, you know, a couple of years. And I, and I worked through the steps and I sat down with a sponsor um, and I did the program the way it's outlined in the book with a sponsor who had a sponsor. <clears throat> and I got to look at that stuff, um, and it was terrible, you know, because I was really afraid that um, of looking at myself because I was the problem. And um, but it was it was you know it was a it was a great experience for me. Um, I'm one of those people who likes to. I think that if I know why something happens, that I can fix it, that I have that power, um, and that I can change people. Um, and that I'm responsible for all these things in God's kingdom that are absolutely ridiculous, and that's part of my insanity. So um, I remember after I read my fourth step to my sponsor, and he went down uh, the list of notes that he had made about my skill set and who I was as a person, and um, I felt pretty hopeless um, because it was like, and it was someone that I loved and trusted telling me for the first time, me opening up. And I did the big, deep, dark secrets thing, you know. And, um, you know, thank God I had a sponsor that had a way worse story than I did. And he'd done a lot of way worse things than I did. And I was like, oh, wow, really? Okay. Um, yeah, mine's like easy, you know. I, I did this and this. Um, but he read down that list to me. And 
I said, I said, Rob, you know, what do I do about this stuff? I mean, this is some serious stuff. And, um, he said, you know, you'll be amazed, David, to find that one day you'll wake up and all you got to do is turn it over to God. And, um, that was really cool. I mean, I will never, ever forget that because I was really, really hurt and really bad at that moment. And when I left, I, you know, I felt okay. I felt pretty good, um, that I'd actually, to, to what I thought at the time, my perception was I was completely honest with this person. Um, I hear, I think as honest as I possibly could be. And when I looked back over it, you know, it took me three months to do my first four step and it was getting to the point where I was just, you know, I was listing like everybody uh, that I could possibly think of and like going through high school yearbooks and just going back and, and, um, and I'm really glad that I did that. Um, but man, I, you know, I don't know. I'm really grateful to be here. I haven't been to a conference in a long time and, um, I, I'm not nearly as involved and I don't nearly give much as back to this program or work this program as hard as my sponsor does. Um, and some of the guys who he sponsors, I just, uh, I'm in the book with him again, and it feels like, man, it may take me three years to get through the damn book with him this time. But, um, I, you know, I like what uh, this gentleman said about how our lives change um, and how he, he looks at his big book, and there's different parts in there uh, that are outlined because that's been my experience. I'm not the same person I was when I got here six and a half years ago. Um, my life has completely and totally changed. There are things about me at my core, my character defects and fears that are exactly the same as they used to be. Um, but whether or not I choose to act on those behaviors is uh, based on my spiritual condition and what I'm doing. Um, so I have a lot of really good examples in this program. Uh, a lot of guys that are really working this program and doing the deal. And, um, you know, I, I will never stop coming to Alcoholics Anonymous as long as I have a say. Uh, this program saved my life. And you people in here saved my life. And, um, you know, if I can just keep that shroud of willingness to show up and listen and learn and to stay teachable, you know, I have a chance. Um, and that's all I got. Thanks. Okay. Do we still have time? Yes. Uh, my name is Doug. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Ah, uh, wow. Um, I'm glad I made it up here again. I think I've, uh, Made all of the Fellowship of the Spirit conferences and um, just have an amazing experience every time I come up here. Um, you know, the fourth and fifth step, I've done <clears throat> several of them. Um, but just listen to everybody share. I, I was thinking about the first one that I did. And, man, when I first came to AA, wow, was I uh, I was out there. Um, you know, and I, I can still get out there, but... Um, I, I wasn't able to ask for a sponsor, and, and I just came to meetings, and I was sharing some really sick stuff, and had a guy, a, a station over in Germany, and I had this guy came up to me, and, and he said, he said, look, Doug, I'm going to be your sponsor, um, and we're going to work the steps, you know, and, and the guy saved my life. I know that he, uh, he saved my life. He, uh, he said, he said, I see you got a big book, so get a note, uh, a notebook, and come over to my house this Sunday, and we're going to work the steps. So I did. You know, I, I was in enough pain. I went over to his house. And um, two Sundays, we uh, did a lot of reading in the big book. We got on our knees and prayed, like I've heard people talk about, and uh, got through the first three steps in two Sundays. And, um, and then we got started on a fourth step. And he said, look, he said, this book, he said, it's right here. It's, it's really simple. It's laid out right here for you, you know, the fourth step. And... Um, he said, don't complicate it any more than it needs to be. He said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to write, um, there's three areas, resentments, fears, and sex. And uh, all those scare, <laughs> scare the hell out of me, especially <laughs> sex. You know, I want to, addressing my sex life. And, and uh, you know, but that's what we did. And, and we did it just like it says in the big book, you know, in my resentments. Um, you know, just like it says there, I, who am I resentful at? The cause. Um, what it affects in my life, and then where was I selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and afraid? And when I did that and we started looking at it, I said, again, I'm selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and afraid. And then we went to the next one. I'm selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and afraid. And then the next one, you know, and, and uh, 
and it just was an amazing thing for me to be able to see that um, that that was a common thread throughout my whole life, you know. Uh, and then we looked at fears, and and um, man, did I, uh, you know, I, I uh, had a lot of fears, and, and still incapable of having having fear if I'm running on self will. Um, but the bottom line on fear, you know, it says. Um, I asked God to remove my fear and direct my attention to what he would have me be, you know. Um, amazing things happen when I do that. Uh, just one example of that is, is when I was over a station over in Germany, I was, I was teaching, uh, I was in a teaching aircraft maintenance and, and uh, something that I was told to do, I didn't volunteer to do, and had a ton of fear about it and, and um, you know, not feeling good enough about it, self-worth and all that stuff that goes along with it. and, and um so I was going in, I had to teach this class, and I had never taught it before, and I had this room off in my classroom, and I went in there, and I got on my knees, and I prayed that prayer, you know, to, for God to remove my fear and direct my attention to what he had had me be. And um, and I went in there, and it was like it was a different person standing up in front of the class, and and I just, it blew me away, you know, and uh, really taught me the power of prayer, you know, and then um, the sex inventory, I, I think, well... I can speak for myself that there is no way that I harm another person greater than through selfish sex, you know, and I had plenty of that on my inventory. Um, I've been married and divorced three times, and I brought two kids into the world that uh, I love more than anything in the world, but they were unplanned. It was a result of selfish sex, um, you know, and, and uh, there was an abortion. Um that still uh, can kick my butt if, uh, you know, I, I know I'm forgiven for it, but, um, you know, as a result of, of that, um, you know, and, and I've uh, continued on with that. I, I've, uh, there's been other areas where I, I've, I guess, delved deeper into that because uh, maybe I'm sicker than others and, and uh, I've really addressed that part of my life and, you know, by way of working the, the steps in the big book and, and have had amazing spiritual awakenings in, in that area of my life as a result of being honest, you know, and, and uh, working the steps. So, yeah, this is, um, you know, these steps definitely saved my life. So, thanks. You left out. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. My name is Enzo. Yeah. Good morning, you guys. Good to be here. Um, fourth step, fifth step. Um, yeah, it saved my life, absolutely. Um, I could not have made, you know, could not have made it through the steps if I hadn't done a thorough fourth and fifth step. And the um, for me, it was really shocking because it was the first time in the fourth step, it was the first time I was writing this stuff down. And uh first time that I saw myself for what I really am, you know, I saw, I didn't realize I was so full of fear and I didn't realize I was such a bad actor. <laughs> I really didn't, you know, I thought I, I had this delusion that I was a really giving guy <laughs> and I just had a bunch of bad breaks. And I just wasn't, life wasn't fair and I was going to somehow learn to deal with that. And, uh, and it turned out not to be true. You know, I was always the hero or the victim in my life. And uh, the fourth step, and I, I was crazy when I was writing the fourth step. Um, you know, I'd be sitting there writing and I'd be feel elation. It's like, oh, my God, it's becoming clear. This is what's wrong with me. And then 10 minutes later, I'd be bawling, going, oh, crap, I'm screwed. How am I going to, you know, how in the world is this going to be fixed? Um and my sponsor's suggestion was put pen to paper every day, even for 10 minutes. And uh, that helped. I got some traction, and then I dropped it, the ball for about a month and then finally finished it up. Um, I'm grateful he was there to show me how to do it. Uh, and then in the fifth step, uh, that was a real turning point for me also uh, in my life and in my recovery because... You know, so we sat there and it took six or seven hours and I went through everything, all my secrets, all the inventory suggested in the book, um, things I thought I would take to my grave. Um, but I was willing. I was desperate enough. I was willing. It's like, God, I don't want to go through this again. I'm going to do it thoroughly. And at the end of 
me telling him all this stuff. Um, he said, I, I love you, and I'm never going to leave you. He looked me right in the eye and told me that. And that was, that to me, that was just as important and had just as much of an impact on me as all the work that I had done under his guidance before that. Um, because my fourth step had shown me, you know, my, some of my core core beliefs, these core fears, you know, core fear that I wasn't good enough, that, you know, if anybody found out who I really was, they wouldn't stick around, that fear of abandonment. You know, and here was a man who had heard everything about me, the man who now, at that point, and still today, knows more about me than anybody else on the planet, including my parents. Um, then he didn't leave. You know, he did the exact opposite. He committed to me. You know, he committed to me. I'm here for you. Let's let's continue doing this doing this thing. So, you know, what uh, it was not what I expected. Um, uh, it didn't feel how I expected it to feel. I was kind of back on my heels uh, after I did my fifth step, and I went and did six and seven after that. Shortly thereafter, um, and things changed. Started to change. Uh, rapidly. It was a big inflection point in my sobriety and in my recovery. Um, my heart changed a little bit. My mind started to change and my faith started to grow. Uh, my, my hope that I could recover and uh, get a little bit of peace in my heart and in my head uh, grew as a direct result of a third, fourth, and fifth step. So I'm grateful. And, you know, I'm grateful they're, the steps are here. They're available. I'm grateful that you guys were here, you know, that Alcoholics Anonymous was available to me when I was ready, and that my sponsor was there and willing to take me through this. Um, so if you're new uh, and you haven't done your fourth and fifth step and you're in the book with a sponsor, or if you're not in the book with a sponsor, get with your sponsor, stick around. My, You know, my suggestion is just do it. Um, it will be unlike my opinion is it will be unlike anything you've ever experienced in a very positive way. So thanks for letting me share. Okay, I just want to thank our panel speakers again and for everybody who participated. And so we've gone through five panel sessions, well not five, but we did the first five steps. And I just want to say if anybody that has questions about any of these steps, especially four and five since there's so much to them, there's a lot of people here at this conference that know exactly, you know, what to do and how to help you and how to answer your questions. So please ask. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.